You're listening to FFOP Radio. Reach the eye. Show. My name's Dave, and this is a Fistful of Podcast from FFOPRadio.com. Back for another great week. Now, you guys, I don't want to get too excited about stuff, but this is something I've been wanting and planning and hoping for for a very long time. This is another special themed episode. I know you guys love these. Uh, we're talking all about dinosaurs again, and in studio, uh, I've got a very special guest. A local paleontologist works for the Arizona Museum of Natural History. We have Gavin McCullough on the show. Thank you very much. That's quite the intro. I don't know if I can live up to that. Dude, it's so, like, I can't tell you. I was talking to, you know, everybody who listens to this show will probably have heard the Andy Fark interview by now. And I was telling him, like, I have cornered you at so many conventions and meetings and stuff. I'm sure you're probably sick of me hanging around. It's been great to see you. It's, I can't tell you, like... I, you know, so, so, you know, before I get gushing too far and I go far off track, let's, um, uh, so how long have you been at the Museum of Natural History here in Arizona? I technically started there part time, I think in 1999, just as a four hour a week, oh, wow. uh, working as a, a, a lab, lab worker. I think I was kind of sort of their part time preparator and lab manager at the time. I was still taking some grad classes at ASU really? and then just really kind of part time. So boy, if you count that, but then I went off to South Dakota for grad school for a couple of years. And I think I've been back with this permanent position for 15, almost 16 years now, actually. So, yeah, but I, you know, I'm, I'm, I think it's better. The, the museum is better for it. Because I think every time you show up at a at a, an event and you like, you know, you do your whole shtick, you got your art thing. I think every ever ever since you came and, and like, you know, we're the face of the paleontology section of things. I think it's it's definitely benefited like for it, for no other reason than like the, the T-Rex stamp release. Oh, for, yeah. For our listeners who are unfamiliar here in Arizona, or I guess it was nationwide, but there was a big deal of in Arizona. So we have T-Rex stamps that released and we had yes. special commemorative envelopes that are s- sitting right behind me on this, this shelf here hmm. that um, Gavin actually, uh, you know, had, there was a commemorative envelope, if I remember correctly, that you had something uh, yeah. design wise in. Yeah, that was that was the brainchild of my boss, curator, Dr. Bob McCord, who is I from what I gather he is a filet flail stamp guy yeah oh, um, oh, philatelist, philatelist. <laughs> yes, okay. um we were we had a discussion about how you pronounce that mm-hmm. when we were doing this and that was kind of his idea he thought why don't we do something to sort of commemorate this stamp because the stamps the postage stamps themselves are super cool I, I don't know cool. if they still are selling them now but at the time they were um that optically yeah they're like holographic holographic almost, like yeah. those, those old-timey trading card type Right. They're very cool. Right. I, I, I bought some a few weeks back. I don't know if they still have them, but every time I go into the post office, I double check because you can never have enough. Like, I'm not going to send any letters, but I've still got, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've still got a place to put dinosaur stuff in here. Yeah. Um, they, they're those those stamps, those that, that I think that's uh, Julius Cassonti, I believe, is yeah. the artist. Unbelievable. Those are so gorgeous. Really good. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Like, there there is some amazing paleo art out there. Oh, my there. gosh. Yeah. <clears throat> I really love the... I don't know if it's the necessarily the modern trend, but in about the past 10 or 15 years, I've noticed that um, a lot of paleo artists are really kind of trying to go for the natural with, mm-hmm. with lighting, with even um, kind of certain things being out of focus, sort of as yeah. something you might actually see if mm-hmm. you were taking a nature photography picture. And that really, to me, that kind of like it's almost an imperfection that really brings the thing to life for me. Yeah, when I see something like that. Paleo art does a lot of things for a lot of people. And I think for the most part, it's just like imagine these monsters and like, whoa, like amazing. But there's there's hardly ever an opportunity where you see something because, you know, like I was I talk about this a lot, but like the things that we see that are fossilized are a very small slice of that pie that was actually alive. So just like when you see paleo art, every time I see a paleo art, like where there's, you know, just this rolling landscape and all these dinosaurs. That's just a fraction of what was around. And it's so mind blowing. Like one of the coolest things about paleontology is like, it's a hole that you'll never 
Like you can make it as big and deep as you want. It's, it'll always be a hole. There will always be deeper. It will always be places to go. Because I don't think 65 million years is a lot of time to lose a lot of information. Right. I don't think we're going to get to the bottom was of it. Was that a double entendre? Talking Perhaps. about deeps and holes. That was a pretty good <laughs> paleontology. That was good. I thought you liked yeah. that. Um, well, thank you for coming to that stamp opening, by yeah. the way. That was a that was a completely uh, sort of surprise thing to see if anybody would come to that, because who knows? You know, there's dinosaur people and there's stamp people. Are there were there both? But turns out there were. Yeah, I think <laughs> that's part of the thing. I think I think nerds tend to move in clumps. So if you're a dinosaur nerd, there's a probably a pretty good chance you're into other nerdy stuff. So there's a pretty big Venn diagram for you. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> and that what was an interesting opportunity to sort of do a couple of things, have that sort of, as you were saying, personalized kind of Arizona centric thing mm. and uh, put a T-Rex on there. But also we had a, a, oh, a cancellation stamp, I think, of the of Susie Tyrannus, yes. which is that fairly newly described mm -hmm. um, Tyrannosaur from New Mexico. And we thought, OK, that's something that actually the post office owns now, owns the rights. Oh, really? To. Yeah, we had to actually we oh. sent them the design mm -hmm. to all these specific parameters and we had to actually go to the post office and stamp all those ourselves. We couldn't bring that back to the museum because it was federal property. Yeah. I remember when we went there, you know, they everybody made a big deal. It's like, this is a temporary post office. So it's not only like, you know, that's the, right. The only post office that has like a mastodon and a mammoth hanging out in the waiting yeah. room. I, I I don't know. I think all that stuff was so cool. Like I've been going to the museum since I was, you know, before I can remember. And I I don't have a lot of memories from when I was a kid when they would be doing stuff like the, like beer and bones that's a more recent mm -hmm. thing that's happened the big stamp release like it, it the museum has gotten super active in the last few years and i love that well thank you i, I love taking my son there you know when when we can obviously when we get back there it, it, it just feels like when i was a kid museums felt very stodgy mm -hmm. you go in it's very quiet you show you know it's dinosaurs Shh, be quiet. Yeah, quiet like those dusty old bones that yes. are, haven't changed for yeah, but but this museum has really kicked it up a notch and I, I'm super happy about it. Like all, all the like the events and always like it's cool people like there's never been a problem. It's never been like a pain to go there. I'm never like, oh, there's going to be too many people like you don't care because it's like such a cool place to hang out. It's like everybody's favorite clubhouse, at least from in my opinion. I like oh, see. That's what I like to hear. Yeah, what, I cannot get enough of that. Place. And, and I agree with you generally about what you're saying about museums, how they can sometimes they can be medicine i don't know i yeah. mean and, and it's good to have still you know and, and i guess i don't want to necessarily equate medicine with education but right. to have it be something that you want to go you want to go there and learn yeah that's something mm -hmm. that isn't always easy to do i think um no we're like, a little bit lucky because we have you know i'm biased but we have dinosaurs and mm -hmm. dinosaurs are things that are charismatic and bring people in and people want to know about them yeah um we have a lot of other things too we have an amazing anthropology uh, side, active research. Yeah, um, for, but we for, have mammals as well. For the size of the museum, like square footage, I mean, there's so much packed in there yeah, because it like it's layered and it sort of swirls around, and it's it's always been a, like a fascinating bit of construction on top of being full of weird and interesting things, but. Just to say, like, oh, we're going to go look at the Dinosaur Museum. That's not it. Because there's, like, an old jail yeah. that... <laughs> yes. let, me, let me tell you something about the old jail. So, you know, according to, you know, all the plaques on the wall, it was moved from, you know, where it was originally to the museum. And it's just, like, this crazy old iron bars, like, scare... And here's what, what happened that I think made me less afraid of it. You guys finally took that dummy out of there? Because for the like the first 15 years well, of my life, the there dummy. was a sleeping dummy in one of those beds. Really? And so I would go through that Lost Dutchman cave and I would stop at the exit and I would go, OK, I would have somebody hold the door open and I would run my ass through oh. that jail right out to where the gold was because I did not want to see that dummy. It was scary. Oh, I didn't know about that. That would have been a great. <laughs> oh, I wonder if, if we, so we're going to we're not doing beer and bones this year, clearly. Uh, yeah, but. Um, we did just have a meeting with our foundation and they are planning on having it in 2021 if I'm the world glad. doesn't end. Right. And I, it, boy, I like that dummy idea. Maybe we'll put somebody in that, uh, in one of those jails. I tell you, have man. Have sit up and scare the people who are uh, having a little bit too much beer. As, as a child, two things kept me from fully getting invested. One was that dummy in the, uh, the jail. And the other was that obviously fake dude picking, uh, 
at the wall up in the in the in the mine. Oh, oh yeah, the old lost where it's like the little shadow clink. Yeah, a clink. square of cardboard with a cowboy hat on it, and this little thing. And like as a kid, I was like, oh my god, he's gonna hear me. Like I'm running through the little, <laughs> little. Oh my god, he he's gonna like he's gonna hear me breathing when he's not picking, and he's gonna come get me. But now I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> so we, many crazy so, memories so you you've you've gone to that museum since before it was kind of more of a natural history because it's only Forever. been a natural history museum since technically since 07 is when we changed the name yeah i i don't I remember what it was called i think you know when it, we were little we just said oh, we're gonna go to the museum mesa southwest museum is yes. what it was called yeah, before okay. that but then it's had a few names even before that because mm-hmm. it, it was a it may have just been the mesa history museum or something when it first started but it's had it's had about three or four names since it opened in 1977. It was yeah. really just like a little schoolhouse in that jail back then. It's, it's gone through a lot of changes too, which is something I want to talk about because, you know, I hang out in downtown Mesa a lot because I think it's just a fun place to be. And I noticed there's a lot of construction and stuff going on in the museum. And I know, you know, I follow you guys on Instagram. So I know that there's some cool new, there's a, a hadrosaur uh, going in. We've got uh, a T-Rex and stuff. So, so can you spill a little bit about what's going on? Yes, actually, I'd love to spill a little bit what's going on. <laughs> because we're closed, we're not able to have people come in. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's slowed down a lot of things, but we're trying to do other things to kind of keep ourselves busy. And we're right now, sort of the main things we're doing right now is we're really supporting the community and supporting teachers because yeah. we're kind of trying to make a lot of um, online education for science educators and schools around town. Um, I think I have to be in a video actually in a couple of weeks. I'm going to have to, I guess, wear pants and shave, I guess. I don't know. Um, but we're doing things like that, trying to kind of help them sort of navigate this new world. Yeah. That everybody's working on kind of, and, and, um, we are also working on that exhibit that you alluded to. That's called 75 million BC. I'm and excited about that one. Me too. Yeah. Oh that's actually something that we are, um, we're, we we usually have a lot of volunteers coming in and help work mm. on the exhibit during right. our, our, our one day of the week on Monday because we're not open then. But now we're not open at all. Right. So, so we're pretty much working on that constantly, time, yeah. although we have fewer people. There's only a few people in the exhibits department, but they are just doing great guns, amazing mm. work. Mm. I'm going to just name drop them right now if you don't mind. <laughs> no, by all means. Yeah. Okay. So um, the exhibits chief is Jim Walters. We have amazing exhibit artist Benji Paisno. Michael Keller and our amazing graphics guy, Michael Ramos and everybody, all of them are working on it. And also people from other departments are helping to chip in to work on it. And it's going to be exciting. And like we've got dinosaurs, but it's also going to talk about kind of what's going on in Southern Arizona and Northern Mexico in that time period, 75 million years Mm -hmm. ago. So there were volcanoes and forest fires. It was, (sighs) you know, pretty epic and scary. And right now they're actually trying to figure out how are we going to bring that, experience of not just seeing the dinosaurs fleshed out in life Mm -hmm. which yeah we're gonna have a tyrannosaur as you noticed yeah very cool Um, very cool we've got hadrosaurs now a lot of these things are somewhat fragmentary when we find them so we don't necessarily know exactly which ones they are so so the 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 exhibits going in that tyrannosaur and that hadrosaur are are, those are as of yet incomplete species the tyrannosaur is is unknown Okay, um, that, so it's the not tar- a Rex. They're not, it's like no, not it's putting not a big, Rex. They're not dropping a big name in there. No. Um, this is about 10 million years before T-Rex. Okay. Uh, this is a, a time in the, in the Lake Cretaceous called the Campanian. And there's actually quite a few, just in the past, gosh, 10 years or so, and probably even, what time is it today? There's probably a new one named <laughs> yeah. now. There have been a lot of large tyrannosaurs from that time period been showing up and being named in the past 10 or so years. That's and the- that dinosaur that... Benji created is sort of a mixture of some of those new known tyrannosaurs. So it's a big tyrannosaur. Oh, yeah. It's not as big as T-Rex. Mm. And so ours, we don't have enough necessarily to know exactly which one it is. So we're kind of basing it on the ones that we do know that okay. have been named from the area. So so where are these specimens that this exhibit is based off of from? They're not local, right? They are not local as far as Mesa, but they are Arizona. Okay. And some uh, northern Sonora as well, All where right. there actually has been a recently described hadrosaur that Benji's hadrosaur, it's kind of a gripasaur, mm. is sort of based on. So we know that there are, we probably, that's probably the one we know most about, if I'm thinking about that right, is that we know it's probably like a gripasaur type mm. hadrosaur. And we have some indication of um, some, a totolomimus. It's a, it's really? one of the, yeah, it's, it's, it's 
I think it's the southernmost ornithomimid now, really? if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And I don't know if that one's been on Instagram that much, but it looks great. Benji's model looks great. It's all <laughs> foofy and fluffy. Yeah, I've seen I, Yeah, with the big um, crazy hair. Yeah, and yeah I do. Um, like to me, that. it looks like Billy Idol, but um, I think it's its real name is. Um, oh, I can't remember what we've named. We've named them all. Benji's yeah, them yeah, all. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I try and keep up and remember. So when I go in, I can point them out to my yeah. son. But yeah, like even if here's the thing, even if you don't, because we've got a lot of listeners from all over the country mm. and even like across the pond, keeping up with Arizona's museum isn't like you're just going to keep up with Arizona. Like there's so much crazy stuff happening here. Mm -hmm. Like I feel like every time we talk, you blow my mind with something else. Like the fact that we had flamingos here. I mean, we've got that. There's the famous Chandler mammoth, I believe. Is it Chandler Gilbert? Uh, yeah, there there are actually, I guess, two Chandler mammoth finds. One went, one from the 80s, and then the more recent one was from 97, I think, was when they yeah. excavation. It, and you don't think, I I never think anyway, yeah. because I when I'm thinking of, you know, Arizona Cretaceous, like my favorite epoch, you know, we're basically Good choice. middle. Yeah, we're basically in the sea. <laughs> Like, we've got a little bit on the side there, but we were basically a, a, a big-ass ocean, which is kind of a bummer because I would love, like, the type of variety and stuff that, like, all the Dakotas and the uh, everybody else, like the Badlands get. But, you know, it, it's still cool that we've got these, you know, weird megafauna. We've got these crazy mm. birds. We've got, like, glyptodonts and the tortoises and stuff. Glyptodonts, my favorite mammal. So cool. And I He's... Well, he's up there for me. Mine's always going to be the Paraceratherium because I love saying that word. That's a, I don't think I can even say that word. Yeah. <laughs> People you say, what, well, what's your favorite? Like this question always comes up for me anyway. What's your favorite megafauna? I say, obviously, it's the Paraceratherium. <laughs> <laughs> it took me. I don't know why. Like I, I've been into dinosaurs forever and I something clicked in my mind like the past couple of years where I'm like, OK, dinosaurs are cool and everything. But I don't feel like people from the EOC and the Pliocene, all the people who work on the like the megafauna. Mm -hmm. I don't think they get shouted out enough. Mm. So I would like to sort of do something around them. Mm. Cause you know, dinosaurs will get play. Even like the, the most downplayed dinosaur gets more ink mm -hmm. than the most famous, you know, burrowing mammal of the, whatever, like the, the ice age. So I, I would like to one day, if you're, if you're up for it, do that sort of thing. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, and if I, can I, can I talk a little bit about what you were saying about the Cretaceous and how we seem to maybe not have as much, cool stuff sort of preserved as opposed to other places. Yeah, by all so, means. Some of that is due to something else that this exhibit's going to address, and that is all these volcanoes and all mm -hmm. of these, these kind of uh, epic earth processes that were happening, not just at the time, but which is kind of cool. This, this exhibit is going to talk about how mm -hmm. um, it, it looks as though our dinosaurs and other animals were existing in a, a pretty high mountain environment which is also a kind of an unusual huh. an unusual preservation condition. Yeah. So kind of high mountain lakes and oh, okay, um, okay. yeah, things like that. We've actually got one of our researchers, Dr. Grant Boardman is doing some isotope work on some of the clams. Now, this is another thing when you kind of think about things that don't get a lot of play, you might uh, not think, okay, who cares about clams and right, snails? They're yeah. not that exciting. Ooh, boy, like brachiopods and, or brachiopods or yeah. things like that. <laughs> But um, the stuff that he is getting out of the information from the shells is he's able to get – he's able to sort of get elevation essentially from this. Yeah. And so that's kind of interesting. That tells you that, oh, crap, these things were way the heck higher than maybe we had thought before. Yeah. I – you know, it, for, for me anyway, every time there's like a big mind-blowing revelatory thing, like I remember – you know, this isn't like a, a mind blowing thing, but when they were pulling bones out of Alaska, like all those pachyrhinosauruses mm -hmm. and stuff, and it was like, oh, my God, how do they live up here? Like, I'm so over like, obviously, they lived everywhere. Don't come to me and be like, can you believe that? Yeah, I believe it. Mm -hmm. They had the earth for 100 million plus years. Yeah. If, if you told me that, like, one of them designed a slot machine, I'd be like, yeah, that is completely <laughs> believable. I would buy that, sir, for a dollar. That's why they went extinct. They were just, just staring at the yeah, slot Yeah, they, they became the slot time. jockeys. Yeah. And it was just yeah. <laughs> the end. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, there was all those things happening then. And we have evidence also of fairly regular forest fires happening there, which is kind of cool, too. Well, as the um, tradition continues today. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> Uh, so, well, I mean, actually, that's 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 a good point to bring up, because one of the things that paleontologists sort of have to kind of deal with is a lot of modern processes that we sort of see around us. We kind of can apply to the past mm -hmm. so we can actually in fact, we have to look at things that are happening now to kind of yeah. try to interpret what's like going they just on started. Then. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then we had. So that's something you can sort of see 
happening fairly often back then where fires going up and mm-hmm. it's, i mean it's kind of just part of the ecology yeah it wasn't there wasn't some little trudon to like you know lighten a little match <laughs> or anything like that it was just happening but less frequently though i guess fairly frequently were pretty big stinking volcanoes going off probably about every million-ish years or so down there really yeah so and as uh, dr mccord likes to point out when he talks about this, this is kind of his baby pet project area. It's where he sort of has done most of his research is that uh, many people, probably people our age and older, sort of think of one of the first images you see when you're a kid of a dinosaur. Think of something is there's a volcano in the background. Definitely. That, that's kind of pretty darn uncommon in actuality. Yeah. So, I, I, <laughs> so here and this is an area where we actually do see maybe there were you know, hissing volcanoes in the background with dinosaurs, but that, it wasn't happening all the time, but they would, you know, ruin the day of everything around oh, them at for the time. Sure. And oh then, then after these things happen, we get these big calderas that collapse when the, mm-hmm. and that's actually where a lot of the copper comes from, from the state too. A lot of the copper mines are right over caldera deposits. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah Cause we got there's huge deposits out um, east of here in like, if you're, if you're local superior globe, all those places out there were huge copper boom towns were back in the day. Anyway. Yeah. So it was pretty fantastic. Uh, uh, um, and it was a, a period of time that. I still think when I think Cretaceous, just in my kind of five year old brain, mm-hmm. I still honestly have to be honest with myself. I think of the terminal Cretaceous dinosaurs. I think of T Rex, right, 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 right? Those right, are, yeah. And this was 10 million years before that. So you've yeah. got different forms that would have still been recognizable and they were, you know, related to these later things. But we also have, and something I, I have been told I can mention, and I think I, I had told you a little bit, <laughs> yeah. we have. <laughs> We have the Arizona's first ankylosaur, which is incredible which is news. Awesome. Like if you're if you're a fan of this show from way back in the day, you'll remember we got uh, Victoria Arbor on to talk about Zool and that amazing find. But now we've got that something local, which I think, and you know, my wife is also Gaga over, so I'm, I'm interested to see what comes out. You know, of, of all this, me too. I, I'm excited. Uh, you know, I'm still working on it. I'm actually. No chiseling at it right now <laughs> um just... it, it, it remains to be seen if we have actually enough to say too much i doubt mm-hmm. we'll be able to get to genus to Can... be honest because it's we don't have it's but i don't know for sure yet so Do I'm we still... got like a locale of like where it was or is that it's a in the same area no it was this is from southern arizona okay this is from sort of southeastern arizona so um, like how many active digs like let's say on a given like on a busy season or whatever like let's say right now if if the world wasn't crazy how many mm-hmm. active digs would be going on day to day um or like month to month i imagine just from our museum yeah maybe? like like if you're if you guys get together you know you and the, and the southwest paleontological society say hey we're gonna go out on a dig like how often does that happen you're bringing specimens back to the museum probably during the summer nah, not much <laughs> yeah um, that's not much the southwest paleontological society um, not only works with us, but they also work with uh, Doug Wolf and the Western Western Science Center out of California okay. as well. Yeah, and they're working a lot in the Menifee Formation, which is another Campanian, um, mm. really fruitful dinosaur, and and just all kinds of things are coming out of that. Another recent Tyrannosaur, uh, another Tyrannosaur came out of there a couple years ago now. Dynamo Terror, yeah, um, there's so and a lot many, of things, man. and um. Uh, I, I believe that uh, Doug Wolf is going to be uh, reinvestigating Zuni Basin, oh, where Zuni, Zuni Ceratops? Ceratops and those those amazing critters huh. come out too. Yeah, um, that's a whole other Cretaceous fauna from a slice of time that is just really, really underrepresented anywhere. That that time period, about ninety two ish million years ago, mm-hmm. there's really not many terrestrial fossils anywhere because really? sea level was the highest. Oh, that yeah. Okay, so that makes sense. Basically, there just wasn't mm-hmm. as much land for their dinosaurs to be on. It. Yeah. That was kind of the height of the Western Interior Seaway. And it's interesting because the stuff that they get out of there are kind of small versions of the larger things that we are more familiar with in the Cretaceous. And the part of the Cretaceous that we're working on is quite a bit later. And we have kind of the, the, the you know, larger but not quite terminal versions of the things mm-hmm. that you're familiar with in the yeah. Cretaceous. But sorry, that was... Uh, a little bit off the question oh. <laughs> um so a lot of times they go out with with that group sps will go out with that group um i think kind of in may that's before it gets too hot we our muse- our direct museum projects we are you know when the weather's nice mm-hmm. we'll be out in october november up until april and okay. so 
you know, maybe, and then I've got a, a project up by Black Canyon City they go up to a few times a year as well um, when the weather's nice. So we, we can, during the decent seasons, have about maybe four different things going on. That's not bad. Yeah. Like, I, you know, thinking of Arizona, like, you know, it's hot most of the year, so that's off, off limits. But if you're into dinosaurs, your your attention always gets pulled to the the bigger, like even New Jersey. I feel like New Jersey has mm-hmm. way better dinosaurs than us, which is unfair. Yeah. But but yeah. <laughs> you always think of like, you know, the Badlands, the, the Morrison Formation, mm-hmm. uh, all these other, you know, like uh, Pete Larson and the Black Hill Institute. Mm-hmm. And like it's it's all out of reach. So it's it's always awesome to hear that there's more and more of these species popping up like locally. Yeah. But, you know, even locally, like where was this landmass 65, 75, 100 million years right. ago? Like it wasn't anywhere near it somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you know, a, a lot of. You know, I blame the geology for the reason we don't have as many good stuff. I mean, there's no doubt. People always ask, why don't we have T-Rex in Arizona? Well, well we just haven't found it yet. Yeah. I'm sure it was down here. I mean, there's yeah. no reason they it were wasn't all over down the here. place, man. But we've had so much violence happen mm. geologically that things have been crushed, smashed, collapsed, yeah. buried, mushed, baked. Yeah, and everything so comes out like it's just, it's e- just everything <laughs> is just a nightmare here. And the soil is crazy hard. It's just rocky. And it's like the least accommodating for fossils uh, for, for, for things that are that old in general except for you know the earliest dinosaurs up at the petrified forest area where mm. you get some of those but then again you don't you those are just very nice horizontal layers there hasn't really been a lot of you know mountains being built and volcanoes exploding right. and tearing things up yeah um, for a little while now <laughs> um whereas you know we've got things down part of the problem and i guess part of the fun of untangling the 75 million year old stuff is trying to sift our way through all that geologic mess that's kind Mm -hmm. of happened since then and try to say okay how do we figure out what's going on since so much has happened i mean these calderas that happened back then collapse filled in and you can't see them from the surface they are Mm -hmm. not there's nothing left visually there's Mm -hmm. nothing yeah so there's just been just so much yeah Um, the more I get into Arizona, like locale and the geology of everything, it's 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 you know I guess more that's the principle for everything on the planet though. The more you look into it, the deeper it goes. Yeah. So, but yeah, Arizona is a lot more interesting than I mean, not as far as like yielding stuff. But uh, one of the things I want to talk about while you are here, maybe this will put you on the spot. So we have a paleo site here in Arizona up by uh, Payson. Yeah, and you can pull out. Uh, you know, clams and sponges and crinoids. But if you look in that little cup right there, I've got some teeth, I think. And I right here by your uh, right oh. there. So I want you, if you can, to look at those and tell me what tell I've what got in there. I am so. I, those are the biggest of things that I think mm. might be teeth okay. I've ever found. <laughs> well, uh, you're going to probably hate me uh, because you gave me something. That is one of the few things that I actually can identify from oh! from the Naco Formation. <laughs> That's part of the Naco Formation, right? And it's um, it's a great resource. Mm-hmm. It's a thing that heck anybody who has ever taken a geology course in Arizona has probably visited that site as a yeah. field trip, right? My, my dad was talking about it going there in the '60s, like with yeah. his school trips. So yeah, it's been there. People have been going there forever. Yeah, yeah. Um, roughly 300 million year old uh, uh, oceanic deposits, as you were mentioning, and a lot yep. of sea critters. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and so what you gave me here uh, are these wonderful, broadly pyramidal, triangular shaped things, which probably 95% of people who collect these say uh-huh. they are shark teeth. And well, only because I see the picture of, no, the, of the thing on the billboard. Yeah. Um, that's my only indication right which which um actually that billboard i th- i know someone who uh had some artistry up on that billboard oh do you know uh no, Car- you, you oh yes name that's is right. on I, that drew, I drew a little a couple of those pictures on there right <laughs> yeah but um uh kara kelly who is now a uh, i believe a grad student at u of a but she was an sps member as well she made the art for that and another one of our students who's working on his bs in i believe geology at u of a and he's working on uh, Dinosuchus mm-hmm. stuff. He actually made those billboards as his Eagle Scout project. Really? Yeah, yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, um, 
But 95 probably percent of people who go there think that these things I'm holding that you showed me are shark teeth. And but that 95 percent includes geology professors okay. who take their classes there. All right. Because it looks like a shark tooth. These, <sighs> unfortunately, are not shark teeth or fish teeth. So these these look like they? them. They are part of um, part of a crinoid, actually. Really? Part of the, yeah. So most of the time when you find crinoid parts there, you find the little seg the little stem segments. That yeah, look like you can find the vertebrae all day and night. Yeah. Yeah. So these are, I think, they're either part of the bottom part called the holdfast, which is where they kind of cling to the okay, to the surface. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think they're actually part of the calyx. That's called the head, yeah. where at the top of the stem, where then you've got all the kind of arms coming out the top. All right, that's still you know, but it's still oh, exciting. No, it's super cool. In fact, the fact that you found this many. Was this all in one trip? Oh, yeah. Like, that's not even like a quarter of all the stuff of those particular things mm -hmm. I brought back. Those are just the biggest ones I found. Yeah. Most um, of them are like maybe a quarter of an inch at yeah. like tallest. These are that's a that's a lot. I've never seen this many at once. So you found a lot of them. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I no, love but they're place. still pretty cool. I mean, we get at the museum when we're open and and I think every museum has this people coming in to get their specimens identified yeah. all mm -hmm. the time. In yeah. fact, I think I heard Andy talk about it on one of his. Yeah, I, I, the only reason I haven't done it is because I didn't want to like be a bother. <laughs> no, we love. I, I mean, I, I I we generally really like doing it. I kind of would echo almost everything Andy Farkey okay, said about cool. it, Very cool. except for the few. There's a few folks who actually kind of get very angry, and we've had yeah. some people actually threaten us before because <laughs> they no, didn't like our answer I'm, I'm sure what you do is you spend all day out in the the sun you pull up something and you build it up in your mind and then yeah. you know all this build up and you go to an expert and they say well it's actually not i could see that being devastating if, if you're the, the right yes person. yeah yeah we had a guy show up about five years ago with the back of his truck and there was a boulder i don't know how he got it in his truck <sighs> um, but it was literally i don't know four feet across or something it was a boulder mm. it was a rock and he had was convinced it was a dinosaur egg, and I guess he must have had his friends and stuff. And his wife, or <laughs> I'm not sure if his wife, she was kind of translating for him, and she said he's really like staking his life on this about his life and future. And uh, yeah, and and we, oh my goodness, it was it was it was tough. But listen, I've had my heart broken more times than I can count concerning oh like goodness. fossils and all that other stuff because like. I, I'm the guy who's like wants to just be like, yeah, I like I bought. So there's a there's a rock shop down in Tucson that I love and, and they have tons of like Gorgosaurus teeth and yada, all the stuff you get, like all the little schmaltzy shops and whatnot. And he had this thing and I'm like, oh, I wanted to believe so bad that I looked past all the warning bells because they said, you know, it's a gastrolith from a sauropod. And I was like, oh, boy, oh, boy. And I got it. And I got someone to look at it. And they're like, eh, no, no. Not even close. And I was like, oh, it's still I still have it displayed. I It's in a display case right now. I will show it to you <laughs> because that is a lesson learned, my friend. No, d just because that someone has a smooth rock. Don't let them say, uh, hey, this used to be in a dinosaur stomach. Yeah. And, and from what I understand, even people who work on gastroliths, there's arguments among professionals who yeah, say, that's the OK, thing. do you you found a bunch of round rocks? The next science to... was soft to begin with. And I just covered my eyes and I dove yeah. in, man. I did. <laughs> I think there are some I I, I believe there's like there's acid etching and stuff on mm -hmm. some of the ones that are some more legitimate. Them. Yeah. Like, that's... but that's the thing. A lot of them, from what I'm hearing from a lot of people, I'm like showing this thing to and embarrassing myself about. They're like, you know, sauropods mm, by and large didn't even use gastroliths. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but you know it's it, that that's the you know, the luck of the draw. If you go out yeah. to these rock and mineral shows and you're into fossils, mm -hmm. there's always a bunch of them, and you just sort of have to take it at face value. Yeah. <laughs> well, professionals even we will be tricked all the time right. out in the field. I mean, we'll collect things. I'll pick something up if I'm not sure what it is. I'll just kind of be, what's this? Oh, this looks like a thing. And then I'll be I might maybe disappointed to... <laughs> when I get back. Um, I might have to take you on a tour through my fossil collection to debunk everything that isn't actually what it claims to be. And maybe I can make a little room for some more or legit stuff. Or maybe I will rebunk or, or yeah, I, I don't yeah. know what it's called. What's the opposite if you want to rebunk, rebunk all my stuff. I'll just bunk your stuff. Yeah. I'll get a rubber stamp and I'll yeah. be like, this is Gavin approved. Yeah, there you go. Get a little uh, trading card. Bam. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I had a an, an opposite. I've had a couple of... I don't know what the opposite of picking up something you thought was nothing and then it turned out to be something. Uh -huh. And one was a, uh, a dinosaur bone on Valentine's Day. It was the last last day of the field. Um, we didn't find anything. I was kind of waiting to get back. I had 
told the girl I was going to take her out. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I'll be back by 4 p.m. And we weren't and we were still out there. And I just started digging into the dirt with my knife just and then a rock came out and, I'm, and it was a vaguely bone shape like a vertebrae shaped rock kind of but right. I mean, this is just a trick i know rocks do this this is mm -hmm. another erosional artifact i just stepped chisel at it and sure no it was a friggin really nice vertebra that really? i think we're gonna have on display i think it's a, i'm not sure what it is but it's it's a dinosaur and it's 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 one of the dorsal vertebrae where the ribs come from yeah it's fairly yeah. big and i went oh that's a fine and then the other one this is also a, a sort of a new a first was uh End of the day on another trip, I went to take a a, 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 just a pee break, let's just say. <laughs> and I didn't pee on it, but I was kind of just adjacent. whistling a look at it. Adjacent, thank you. <laughs> yes. I just saw, deposit adjacent. I saw these black chips of something on this little hill next to me, and I'm saying, I'm just going to grab that. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's eggshell. Ha ha, no, uh. it won't be. <laughs> and it's always, uh, it's kind of a... It's a fight inside yourself to sort of say, I don't want to hope this is a thing mm -hmm. because then I don't want to get the heartbreak. Right. Like you're mentioning, if it's not, I just want to be, I, I want to be kind of, you know, the just empirical scientist. This is, uh, I will wait yeah. until the data tell me. Yeah. What, which is hard. Which is hard. <laughs> um, and I kind of, in fact, ignored that stuff until months and months later when I was finally cataloging it and going through the bags. Part of my job is also to clean off catalog, yeah, site numbers yeah. and all that stuff. And I went, by God. I think this might be actual eggshell, and that's another thing we're looking at now. And it's we've got the first reported uh, non-avian dinosaur eggshell from the so, state, also from that area. So, for like the non-enthusiast, when you say non-avian, we are talking about what exactly? We're talking about not bird dinosaurs that aren't birds. So, it, but we, but I'm. It's probably not though, just based on what we know so far from looking at the thin section. It's probably not a theropod okay. at all. So it looks like it's either hadrosaur okay. or it's probably actually not. There's there's a bunch of different ways that eggshell, dinosaur eggshell are kind of categorized. And a lot of mm. it's based on kind of the little prismatic structure that you see right. when you look at it, when you look at it through a microscope at a thin section. And there's all kinds of terminology, of course. There's always terminology and always... Scientific community. Yeah, there is. And there's just <laughs> things I've never heard of that word. What the heck does that even mean? Um so that also is one that we're, I don't know if we can say exactly what it is other than, okay, we're, we've, we've, we've basically eliminated things. We've eliminated okay. crocodilian. We've mm -hmm. eliminated bird. We've eliminated, it, it's a dinosaur, we think. Very And cool. it's not a, we don't, it doesn't appear to be a theropod. So it's likely a hadrosaur because it's pretty small. I mean, hadrosaurs were thin. everywhere. So, I mean, if you roll the dice, it's chances gonna be are. A, that's going to be the bet. I well, mean, yeah. that's exactly what I that's what I tell people when I'm working on a fossil. I mean, what is that you're working on? Well, it's a, it's a dinosaur. Yeah. <laughs> Likely a hadrosaur. Yeah. Just because. Because yeah. they were everywhere, man. Like mm -hmm. they were, you know, some, some of my favorite dinosaurs. Uh, I think the Allura Titan is a very cool thing that not a lot of people know about. I don't even know what that is. The Allura Titan is uh, this huge lambiosaur. It means giant swan. Oh, I think okay. it's like the biggest uh, hadrosaur maybe in the world, but I know definitely in Canada. And that's one of my favorites that I like to flaunt out. It's like, oh, have you heard of the Allura Titan? It means giant swan. You know, no biggie. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things that I even I get confused about all the time is Ornithischian and Saurischian, because to me, it's backwards yeah it, it's it feels confusing. incredibly because you think ornithischian okay so bird pelvis you think mobile you think theropod mm -hmm. no no theropods are sorry so, so what how so birds are lizard hipped yeah so, so a, what's a, the deal a bird which is a theropod is not a bird hipped animal it's a lizard it's 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 it is it's it's just Th there's that's... so much terminology and so and, and a lot of these are kind of things that i think are um sort of holdovers just from when things were named a long time ago. And it's sometimes so... it's easier just to kind of stay with, with certain concepts. I mean, and if they hold together still, if, if the concept is mm. still good, I mean, the fact that there's, there's a whale called the Basilosaurus, right? And right. We're, no one's wanting to change that because yeah, it's not a Saurus. We no. know that now, <laughs> but I don't think whale people are, I guess I don't know very many whale people, so I don't want to speak right. for them. I, th I think anybody who isn't a dinosaur that gets a saurus like clings to that. Like there's some some um, big old reptiles with saur or mm -hmm. not reptiles, sorry, amphibians with saurus on mm -hmm. the end. And you think, oh, that's a dinosaur. But no, it's just like a big slimy, mm -hmm. you know, arrow headed lizard looking uh, newt, essentially. So are you saying they're holding on to the saurus because it gets them attention? Because yeah. people think it's a dinosaur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think <laughs> if I think if someone could do for Therium. What, you know, Cope and Marsh did for Saurus, mm -hmm. I, it would be all over like the dinosaurs. But 
you can't you can't look at a mammoth and be like, oh, that's as cool as a dinosaur because you see a mammoth every time you look at an elephant. Essentially, you throw a wig no. on it, yeah. you throw some tusks on it, you say, oh, that's interesting. There's nothing you can look at in the zoo that is like, oh, that looks like an ornith- ornithomimus. Yeah, no, like, and, and well, that's why I think theriums will be always second banana. Yeah. I don't know. I, I I think a I think an ostrich looks a heck of a lot like a. That's true. I kind of wonder if ornithomimids had like that goofy tuft of feathers that. That ostriches I have. Wonder, yeah, like it looks so stupid. That's the thing. <laughs> but I all, love it. all these like weird little like if if your body type was like evolutionary, it's like, hey man, we're gonna throw it into legs, like the T Rex, all the mm-hmm. ornithomimids, like all those like fast, fast runners. They definitely remind me of like chickens. Like if you own chickens, they run around the yard. Mm-hmm. They look like raptors as portrayed sure. in popular media. And you can definitely see that there. And I think that's cool that something that it, obviously, you know, this is a, a wildly off topic, but I always like to bring it up that Horner is desperately trying to get a dinosaur made right, before I was just he about dies. To munch, mention that he is before so, he died. I didn't know he had that particular goal. I, I just, this is my own personal opinion. Okay. I feel like after, after he helped out with uh, Jurassic park, he's mm-hmm. like, this is my new purpose. Yeah. Cause every time I see him on, on social media or whatever, he's like, we're so close. Yeah. I'm going to turn a chicken into a dinosaur before I die. I before swear to you, dies. like he will be on the top of a mountain, like with a little chicken, <laughs> chicken myosaur and he'll be like this is my purpose and then <laughs> you know it's but boy what what an exciting and crazy thing to think about yeah. that he's doing and yeah. it's it's really last last time i actually saw him or or one of his researchers talk about that at a conference i think they were saying that they're having difficulty with some of the genes involved in the tail. And that yeah. that's what I think is the, is I, been the, is been the, from what I've been keeping up with, like they were able to like get teeth and everything, but something's going on with the tail and they're, they're, you know, it, it's so like far and away, like the opposite of what you think paleontology would be. Yeah. Because he's like, Oh, you know, I'm done digging. Like I, I you, you'd think most like big name paleontologists mm-hmm. do their one thing. And then they coast like, uh, Horner had the the myosaurs in Egg Mountain. Mm-hmm. Um, Bacher had, you know, the dinosaur heresies. Gould had his stuff. Like, everybody has their own mm-hmm. little thing that they make their name off of. And I feel like he's just, you know, Bacher is obviously, he's he's a personality oh, now. He, he is, he's a character in the paleontology community. But I feel like Horner is like, no, you know, whatever. Like, that's all cool and whatever. But mm-hmm. I want to see a living dinosaur. Yeah. And everyone else is like, yeah, they were cool. And Jack Horner is like right there. Like, got to get this thing made, man. Mm-hmm. I got it. He's like, he want, a, you know, in his mind, I'm sure he's like, yep. One day he's going to wake up. You know, he's going to have a cup of coffee. He's going to step outside. He's going to look into his backyard. And there's going to be like four little dinosaurs running around. And he's just going to be like. <laughs> like a chicken backyard. Yeah. He'll be like just throwing. Yeah, just throwing little hunks of meat at all these little like. uh <laughs> Little little t- bipedal <laughs> the monsters running around his backyard, and he's gonna be like, "They said I couldn't." They do said it. I couldn't do it. So and much. here I am. And then he's gonna like, be walking him like he's, you know, I, you know, I'm sure this isn't his character, but like a big, like uh, ankle length fur coat, just four little dinosaurs <laughs> on a leash, and he's like, "Yeah, baby." Like you said, this wasn't gonna happen. I thought you were gonna say he would like. <laughs> Drop dead and they just descend. Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I mean, g- given their their uh, propensity, that probably would happen eventually. But <laughs> until then, he would live high on the hog, man. He would get himself a gold chain with like a just like an, a gold egg with a dinosaur in it. Oh, man. Oh, I wonder. I wonder if he, he doesn't seem that ostentatious. In, no, to but, me. but I bet but if he be could, good, if yeah. he did create a dinosaur, it probably could turn it around for him. Yeah. He'd be like, no, I'm going to go Bacher. I'm going to go 100 percent crazy and flamboyant. <laughs> A, a lot of uh, a lot of those guys and, and 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 women do quite a bit of work after they get their yeah the big thing that gets attention it just doesn't quite right yeah gain but, as but much traction publicly yeah you know to the to the lay person and not mm-hmm. even the, like the lay person like I you know it was like 1988 when I heard about Egg Mountain I'm mm-hmm. like that's his thing even as a kid I was like oh yeah that's his thing man yeah me me too that's 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 the first thing I think of when I think of him and when I think of Bacher, I mean, now I think of his work with Ostrom and sort of mm-hmm. uh, warm-blooded dinosaur stuff yeah, that was that, among the first things that... Yeah. But, of course, he he was then somebody who was then on TV all the time and had kind of the look and the... And the he, he was what paleontology needed. 
because I think there was still a lot of like stodginess from the mm -hmm. Cope and Marsh era. Like it was this the sort of elite academia sort of thing where mm -hmm. like they'd put the bones together and they'd show the random plebs. Mm -hmm. But like this was for scientists. And Bakker's like, no, man, this is like for everybody. I remember he was just like this exploded like a talking head like when all the dinosaur mummies were happening like leonardo and he would show up and he would point at stuff and he's like yep here i am i'm mm -hmm. that's my opinion i'm off to go do some more dinosaur stuff and he was just like this jet setting like crazy old little cowboy and he was like <laughs> my, he's still my favorite paleontologist like as far as like for mainstream appeal like he's where you go to if you want to say you want to get into dinosaurs look up bacher because yeah. he'll get you there into the science while you know sort of conning you with his like mm -hmm. maybe not conning but like really getting you in with his like personality because he's like so excited yeah well th those are important you know occasionally you you will hear some paleontologists kind of grumble a bit about the more charismatic yeah. characters yeah because they are charismatic I, th I think partially and um I think some people think that cheapens the yeah I think maybe a little bit maybe. but it it also gets people interested in the yeah. science and even things like you know jurassic park mm -hmm. you're gonna probably ask any paleontologist yeah. they're gonna there's problems they're gonna <laughs> tell you about the problems or they're gonna say well i stink and love that movie mm -hmm. yeah. at least the first one and a few years ago again at the svp meetings and i can't remember which one it was they actually had oh, i was during i think during the award ceremony a segment about basically honoring steven spielberg mm -hmm. because of jurassic park and how on balance this has been a you know, positive thing for the science of vertebrate paleontology and science in general. Yeah. Say what you will about the movies. You know, I always brag on them for the scientific inaccuracies, inaccuracies and like the sort of mediocre story of the latter ones, but it's a gateway to something. It's a gateway drug. Yes. Yeah. Like that, that's like, Hey kid, come here. You want a little hit of this? And then you're like, <laughs> bam, you're a dinosaur fanatic. Like for most people, but, and, and that's the thing, like Jurassic park will take your average person and get them, you know, if you walk up to the average person, I guarantee they could name five dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And that's because of Jurassic Park. Whereas like, you know, including when, Velociraptor, which yeah. nobody could name before Jurassic no, Park like unless it, you were a dino kid. It just came out of nowhere. And yeah. now it's like blow it blew up the spot. Like it's the Britney Spears of, of uh, you know, tiny theropods. <laughs> so there's like then you go a level deeper and you've got people like me who aren't, you know, out there digging fossils necessarily. But like we can drop. You know, you say, oh, well, who's your who's your favorite French, you know, naturalist, you know, that predates paleontology? Uh, mine's obviously Georges Cuvier. Yeah. Number one, I love his name. Mm -hmm. Number two, like the fact that he was smart enough, like in the 1700s to be like, that's not an alligator. That's a Mosasaur. See ya. Mm -hmm. Like he's got a proboscidea named after him that we, right. that we have in Arizona. Yeah. So. That, I, I remember seeing that documentary, too. But like there are so many like crazy characters in paleontology, too, like Bird, mm -hmm. who was crazy. The the fact that he got like, or was it, uh, it was Chapman Andrews who got himself kicked out of Mongolia. Like people were just going crazy. Like Cope and Marsh were like, oh, you know, here's, here's some, here's a bunch of money and some dynamite. Get on that train, you guys, and go blow up that mountain and bring everything back that you find. Yeah. What? Yeah. I kind of wondered about how often Cope and Marsh themselves actually, you know, did they ever swing a pick? I'm not I sure. That's, I don't think so. I think after reading <laughs> just... all the literature I can on them and the bone wars and all that stuff, mm -hmm. it's never like, you know, Cope landed a pick into a thing. No, it's just like he threw money at it. Mm -hmm. they, they they send a train out with some dynamite and they were like, you know, P.S. If you see the other guy's stuff, you can blow up his stuff, yeah. too. And that's the thing. Like, th that was the elitist thing. It was like these two, like, well, mm -hmm. one was rich and one was like not so much. But we still have this, like, hilarious fight. Yeah. In the scientific community, that's I, I still think is hilarious. Like yeah. one of the funniest things ever is when he put the head on the wrong side of that plesiosaur, and he wait like, oh my god, like that is the <laughs> funniest prank I think ever in science. Where he's like, oh, P.S. The, the head's on the butt. <laughs> oh, I'm out, dogs, and he's like, you know, this guy's an idiot. Oh my god, and they just rag on him for the what, rest what? of the night. Oh my gosh. Well, and you know how the Cope and Marsh, how that hasn't been monetized turned into a movie or a right. hbo series yet you know what that would be i think yeah be? like like everything vintage is being made like i feel like that's the perfect like we had hell on wheels they got they, i know they got trains riding around somewhere like get some people pretending to like blowing stuff up like that was such <laughs> an interesting time whereas now it's like 
Oh, no, no. There's plenty. I'm sure there, there still is a lot of crazy stuff going around. They just don't shoot at each other. It's at least, you know, they do in the literature a little bit. Yeah, I, I know that, um, you know, Morocco has a very prodigious black market for fossils oh, and stuff. So I'm goodness. sure stuff's going around uh, there. Yeah. It, I, I can't blame them because they have the Spinosaur like right under them. So you, but, got, you got a moneymaker like that. You might want to. Uh, yeah. But that, that kind of thing has been one of the. One of the problems with a lot of uh, uh, new fossils that maybe can't be necessarily exposed or given names mm. or researched properly is if they come from a uh, sort of a commercial area that maybe hasn't yeah. been properly vetted. Then there's actually things that like there are these the 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 the, the fuzzy quilled cetacosaurs. One of I think I believe I might oh, yeah. have to uh, one of the first ones I think was a hot specimen uh -huh. from Mongolia, and it was under nobody could look at it because it was it was illegally yeah. ill gotten game. That's the bummer. Is <clears> like <throat> I, I can see both sides because paleontology is interesting, and there's going to be a market for rich people who want full blown dinosaurs in their house. Nicholas Cage wants yeah. a Tyrannosaurus Rex in his foyer. Yeah, if, if Nick Cage <laughs> says, "Hey, I want a like, I want to fill Yankee Stadium with Velociraptor skeletons, mm -hmm. and I want them all wearing like elf hats, and to like be you know whatever, like I just want to sit in the middle and just spin around and look at it," he will be able to do it, mm -hmm. which is kind of a bummer because like all these. Black marketeers are pulling out like Spinosaur stuff. And <clears throat> and once because, uh, you know, there was a there was a, one of the documentaries on Spinosaurs like, you know, this this private German collector had a huge amount of Spinosaur stuff. But since he bought it illegally and like he couldn't trace it back to where like found mm. it, it was just like, well, uh, you know, yeah. sucks to suck. But there's nothing you can do. Yeah, that that that's that's the real problem, you know. In order for something to be available to be studied, it's got to be in a place that sort of holds the public yeah. trust and can be available to anybody. It's like anything else. You need chain of command. Like you can't like these, these no longer are the days of P.T. Barnum where you're going to find the card of giants and people will just line up and be like, I believe this 100 percent. Right. Like you, maybe you can't, now. I don't know. People. Pa, are, yeah, oh, yeah. Maybe now. People. But I mean, by and large, I mean, in the scientific community, yeah. if someone were to come by and be like, where did you find that? And they go, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like, well, then you can't. The, the information, that, that's that's just it. I mean, a lot of the information that we care about, other than just the thing itself, the fossil itself, is the context yeah, that it came from. Yeah, you need that context. And archaeologists also care about that sort yeah. of thing as well. They Because the questions you're trying to answer are more than just, what did this thing look like? It's yeah. what was the environment lived in? What are the things that were around? What was the depositional environment? Yeah. What was going on back then? I always give paleobotanists crap because I think that, like, to go back to a time when there was nothing but monsters and be like, what were the plants like is like a missed opportunity to me, but whatever, like that's still an important part. So mm. we need like, you know, when they're collecting like fossilized pollen and all these like leaves and the insects and stuff like that's all super important. Mm -hmm. Like when you think of a Spinosaur and, and now God knows what you're thinking of because it's changed so radically wow. in the past 10 years. Like it's not even close to what it once was. Right. That, that is, that's a great example of one of these things that is, uh, what a story. I mean, the fact incredible. that the fact that the thing got bombed the smithereens mm -hmm. and there was nothing basically left of it. I and mean, yeah. there was there was quite a bit. But I, if I'm not mistaken, like, even back then, it's still pretty right. much just the horror. The, just just the, for the, the spinal processes. Yeah, mostly. Just feeling really initiated really quick. Like there was this German uh, paleontologist who pulled back like a bunch of spinosaur spines and he had like a fragment of a jaw. And then World War II hit and Blitzkrieg like dropped the building to dust and every bit of spinosaur material was lost. And it stayed that way for like, what, 50 years? Something like that until, until like, you know, um, what, that big find in Morocco. Yeah. In 20, gosh, not like, that long ago. I right, can't no, it was some, it was I couldn't the nail down. Years, a, I yeah, can't remember. Yeah. I can't nail down a year. But but like that, that dinosaur alone, like, let, like let's say. T-Rex has changed a little bit, like the facial features have sort of morphed and everybody's got like the weight distribution or whatever. That's nothing compared to the Spinosaur. The Spinosaur might have well have been a mouse when it started for how much it has changed now. Yeah. And it, it just keeps getting more and more interesting because back when we didn't know much about it, like, whoa, this is an apex land predator. Like it was a hyper carnivore. It probably was so efficient that it like ran itself out of house and home. And then like literally maybe the next day it's like oh actually it was just a fisher sort of thing and like the the sail would sort of attract fish into the shade and then would just eat the fish and you're like well what the and then like every time you blink it's just like well now it's this and now it's this and now it's this and and that's what's so great about paleontology too one of my favorites 
like in the same vein is the Therizinosaur. Oh my gosh. They found those giant clawed arms and they're like, oh my God, this thing is terrifying. And they found the rest of it and it looks like a fat sack bellied chicken. Yeah. It's like a sloth and a turkey had it's a drunken night and had a love so child. So crazy. It's just like this. And doofy it's a theropod. Looking, yes. <laughs> it's just this doofy looking. Like, like imagine oh. the dumbest looking Muppet ever. And like, that's its head. And it's just got this huge belly. And it's just, you just imagine it waddling around, just sort of goofing off, looking for food and stuff. But that's the way it's just presented. And you think, man, what a radical change from these three foot claws. You're like, this is an apex predator. Yeah. And then you look at it, it's got like the head of a golf ball yeah. and the big, big belly and all of yeah. those stuff. It's incredible. It's insane. And it's still one of these super mysterious. Yeah. To you this know, day. critters it's but that's that's the great thing is like whenever you jump in there will be more like there, there's never like going to be a thing where like yep that's the way it is and that's the way it's going to be like you know wh wherever you stand on like i don't know if this debate is even still raging but the the like triceratops taurosaurus thing like we're where I'm still seeing rumblings of like taurosaurs are fully matured triceratops and those are like the <laughs> I stopped paying attention to the to the triceratops yeah. ontogeny thing. Well, but there, that's there a good so example many. of of more data being something that kind of elucidates more information. Mm. I mean the way you know, the, those those you you have an entire growth series from babies to adults. Yeah. So you can make all of these and you, you can do more science. You can, mm -hmm. and sometimes, you know, like I think Horner, sometimes he uh, doesn't mind mixing it up and kind of saying, you know what? I don't really care if yeah. you like this thing. I'm going to go ahead and do, H I'm gonna do whatever thing the is, science leads me. His thing is to quietly ask like a crazy question every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Like he's not Bacher and he's like, here's a sweeping declaration. Bacher's like, or uh, rather Horner's like, I think that the torsor might be the adult Triceratops. And I'm like, that is crazy, mm -hmm. but I'm fine. I think it's crazy, but it's fine. <laughs> well, but you get to have Brontosaurus back now, right? True. So maybe that'll, I, if, that, if, if this turns out. I, I, I feel so bad for all the people I've yelled at over the years for, for Brontosaurus being in and out of, you know, uh, <laughs> scientific credibility. So finally, I'm just like, whatever. Like, it's impossible. No one's ever going to know. They could all be Pokemon. And they could all evolve into different things or whatever. It doesn't matter. Like, there there's still these insane creatures beyond belief. Oh, P.S. Andy Farkey says he hates you. I have to tell you that. That. Oh, four. Which, uh, he, there's multiple. I can think of about ten different things. Did so. not elucidate. He just said his parting words were, "Tell Gavin I hate him." <laughs> <laughs> well, so I had to remember that before I got. It. But uh, but did I forget to buy him a beer? Maybe <laughs> one of these things. That's perhaps. probably <laughs> perhaps. But one of the things we did talk about too is, and maybe maybe you'll I'm sure have the same sort of through line logically was the Nano Tyrannus. Mm -hmm. And he's pretty firm that it's juvenile T-Rex, like the holotype is juvenile mm -hmm. T-Rex, which is kind of a bummer. Why? But, because it, it just sort of we're losing potentially losing a species. Mm -hmm. And I think a, a pygmy Tyrannosaurus is super compelling, mm -hmm. just like the same body structure, just shrunk down, like not a huge change. Still got the same sort of like vascular system in the head or whatever. And, but it's just like this small tank instead of this huge aircraft carrier. So like I, niche partitioning, it's going after. Something. Yeah. Yeah. But that's that's the thing. I love all these little weird variations. Mm -hmm. And if you love that, like sauropods are where to go. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If you if you're one of those people who's like, I love minutia. You cannot go better than sauropods. My goodness, yeah. Oh my gosh. Speaking of, my favorite, yeah. the Camarasaur. Yeah, I've noticed that. I yeah, always yeah. shout that out whenever I do a dinosaur show. <laughs> <laughs> Underloved. Underappreciated. Underappreciated. Yeah. Yeah. Farky's got his Ceratopsians. Hone's got his uh, Tyrannosaurs. Everybody's got their own thing. You know, Wadle's got his sauropods, but they're like big, you know, like everybody, he's like bigger the better. Everybody mm -hmm. loves Sora Poseidon. Everybody loves Argentinosaurus. Everybody loves these huge monsters. But no one thinks about the little like dog sized um, mm -hmm. sauropods that were running around early uh, or late Triassic, early Jurassic, because that's not super compelling to most people because they want big. I mm -hmm. like weird mm -hmm. or even average. I love average. Some of my favorite uh, hadrosaurs, the ones that are just boring no mm -hmm. no horns no nothing they're just running around with their beaks they're giant ducks with arms the non-lambiosaur yeah the non-lambiosaurian hadrosaurs yeah but but you know hey look you know what average that's where 
that's 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 the middle of the bell curve. That's yeah. where everybody is. <laughs> I, I think I think people excel when you look at the average. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Look, you can't argue with average. You can't argue with because there were like it worked. There were so many. There were so many. Yeah, absolutely. You, yeah. You, like you can look at all these specialized dinosaurs and be like, yeah, that's a very cool thing, but it takes almost nothing like ecologically or weather wise or whatever to just you're gone. So mm-hmm. yeah. But all these like, you know, bog standard, like your Triceratops, all these like various stegosaurs or whatever, they're just there and like they deal because mm-hmm. they're just like so many. It's just like, uh. but even like the boring stuff is like, what? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's there's uh, one person's boring is another person's exciting. Yeah, um, that's that's part of it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is, I guess some people really, really want to get into the details that maybe other people don't think about that will then give you more information about uh, just sort of going back to Spinosaurus for a little bit. Mm. Um, I don't think just in my opinion, Spinosaur and I'm not a big, uh, they're great, but I don't think they're super mind blowing. I no, just, okay, I mean, cool. They're, I cool, they're cool, but they're not my favorite. But what I think is also cool about that is it was another example of using all kinds of data, a lot of environmental data, a lot mm-hmm. of other fossils from fish and all yeah. kinds of things they found to create this entire mosaic environment for this beast yeah to say oh this is why this is how this it helps answer questions about why is this thing so weird right just from looking at the bone you can say so much but looking at all those other things that they brought into the picture yeah without the context you don't know hey yeah, yeah. Like, this is the world's first aquatic right. dinosaur and i think one of the weird things about it initially was why are there so few herbivores in this environment it seems to be sort of a heavily meat eating dominated mm. environment. And I think by looking at these other data, they went, Oh, well that there's fish all over the right. place. So this thing is vegetarians. <laughs> yeah. Which is, I, you know, that's just, that's super cool. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that's, that's one of the things you like, some of the things you just start picking up offhanded, like various shapes of teeth and how they work. Like you don't, you don't think about that, but when you're, you're, you just dig into it, you say, well, like they have conical teeth. They're not cutting through something. They're puncturing something. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean? These teeth are flat. These teeth are this. And e- like even little stuff like that, someone can just look at this miniature fossil and be like, here's what it is. Mm-hmm. We've narrowed it down to this family of dinosaurs, which all pretty much look the same. So you can kind of picture it. Yeah. It's always kind of a bummer to me that we don't find any sauropod um, skulls. So we're all just sort of like shooting in the dark. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure they all didn't look like a various like brachiosaur Mm -hmm. sort of brontosaur combo. But they're so like eggshells, like put it, put an egg out in the street and see if it'll last 65 million years. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Sorry. Yeah. One day, maybe. But yeah, I mean, just to become a fossil. I mean, the, 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 the staggering, really narrow requirements of what it takes to be. I mean, I sometimes when we were giving tours in the lab with especially if there's little kids like five kids who are about between five and 12 no five and let's say five and yeah five and 12 they kind of seem to like the grosser things that yeah. and i sort of will yeah. we'll talk about you yeah. know hey who wants to become a fossil when you die <laughs> well, how do you think you'd want do you hey who wants to become a fossil i was like yeah <laughs> and then i go about telling them you know how to become a fossil then i talk about maybe okay so you kind of want to be somewhere where you're going to Get buried fairly yeah. quickly, but not too quickly, because that would mean maybe the water would break you apart. You also don't want to be on the surface too much, because this guy over here, who's a scavenger, he's going to come take your head mm-hmm. off and take it back and eat it and pull your tongue out yeah. and eat your tongue, right? Because that's the delicious part of your skull. So you want to stay together, so you, you know, try to make them think about what it takes to become a fossil. And then that that alone is a pretty, pretty rare thing to happen. Then you think, well, crud. How much time do you have between then and now for all this stuff to happen that you can't even control? The amount of variables are incalculable. So every time, like there's, there's one, one of my favorite just casts and you can see like the, that, that sort of classic sort of Camarasaur that was all just sort of caught in one big piece. Mm -hmm. And people think that's how it is all the time. And it's so far from the truth. Like what watching documentaries, you're just going out in the field or talking to paleontologists. It's like, you know, we found a little piece of rock that was a quarter inch by a half inch. And we're pretty sure that's part of a shoulder blade or a hip bone of some other creature. Like that's the thing you don't get to like, it's not Jurassic Park where you look down and there's just like this perfectly curled half moon raptor. Like you're, you're finding. And that's why I don't think I could ever do that sort of stuff. Cause when, when these fossils get crushed and, and smashed. And so they're like basically, in situ forever. Like you can never bring it out of the rock. Mm-hmm. And then just to try and work backwards and be like, what would that look like if it wasn't smashed? Mm-hmm. 
Oh, like it's staggering. With, you know, <clears throat> but with some of these new tech imaging technologies, they can reconstruct those things. There's now it's sometimes you can uh, not have to even excavate parts of a fossil. You can sort of see through and kind of see it. There was a great talk at SVP where somebody imaged the inside of a dinosaur egg that had an embryo in it. That's so cool. Didn't open it, didn't crack it open. Mm -hmm. They just were able to, I think, CT scan it. Yep. Identify all the bones in it. This hash of just, it may as well... To oh. me, it looked like somebody had taken hash browns and yeah, cut them up and put of, them in there. Oof, yeah. But, you know, they were able to identify all the all the bones and then recreate the actual embryo. So crazy. And I think they maybe they do. even kind of were able to make it move, which yeah. is another thing. I mean, all of these things they can do now with technology, but also just with knowledge of anatomy where, where you know, muscles attach. Yeah. Insert. One of, one of the and, things that, like, everybody's going gaga over is, like, now that... All, the, all these scanning technologies are available and now 3D printing is coming about. Yeah. Like if I wanted to, in five minutes, I could download a dinosaur brain, go out to my garage and print it and in eight hours, I'll have, you know, a stegosaurus brain or what, whatever, because it's all just mm -hmm. available. And like as a child, when I was a kid, it was always like this, this locked sort of gate, the scientific gated community. Yeah. Whereas now it's so open, open access. And it's like, hey man, you want to get involved with this? Here's here's a library of downloadable dinosaur parts. Put them together. Go for it. Yeah. There's never been a better time to be like interested in science. Cuz like nerd culture picked up and as a as a consequence science picked up because that's what most of these nerds are into like me. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, they do seem to feed each other. Um there, there seems to be an an interest in uh, maybe it just has to do with kind of an an interest and a passion in one thing kind of just means that you're going to have that mindset. So mm -hmm. maybe you're going to then pick up a passion and interest in another maybe esoteric thing yeah. that other people don't seem to care about. I don't know. I, I, I'm i pretty sure like, you know, the science and the art community are like so closely like embedded with each other. And that's the thing. The artists want spe specificity. They want like the, all these paleo artists, unless they're like wildly stylized or whatever, they're like, this is the most realistic thing we can get. And like, they just sort of push each other because the scientists are like, what would this look like? The paleo artist is like, like this. And they're like, whoa, I wonder if we can make that better. And so it's just like this raising of the stakes and, and everybody wins because every day there's like, oh, we found a new dinosaur. And now it's like, oh, yawn old hat for like the layman. <laughs> but for me, I'm like, oh my gosh, like it's every day. There's something new. Mm -hmm. So cool. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Gavin, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I love the museum. I love your work. I can't appreciate it enough. So moving forward, where can people find you? Like you, you want to throw out your Instagram? Like, are there places where people can see your work? How would you like to promote what you do? Let's see. I, I think I do. I do have a personal Instagram called Gavin exists, yep. but I don't know if I put much art on it. I don't really, I don't consider myself a paleo artist. Really? I, I, I think the like cat to... drawings are probably one of my favorites. Oh, yeah. I, I draw pictures of cats. Yeah, the cat, the, every time there's a cat on my Instagram feed, I'm like, yep, Gavin's back there at it. Go. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, our museum does have, I know we've got, Facebook, yeah, and that's I think just AZMNH or mm -hmm. Arizona Museum of Natural History, and we do have an Instagram that I occasionally I think about one third of the time I I am messing around on there. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the AZMNH Instagram that should also get you there. But yeah, we are just we're staying busy working on everything we can. I mean, we've got our exhibits. Oh, another exhibit we have coming up. I guess we we do you know about the do you remember the Dino Zone exhibit? I don't know if your kid was old enough to go to it the dino when, when the last zone. time you were there. It was a, it was sort of a um, it was a really fun uh, reuse of some of the rubber dinosaurs we had on the mountain for probably since you were a kid. Oh yeah. We oh, took God, we I took a lot this. of those down cuz yeah. they were getting old and kind of mm -hmm. falling apart yeah. and um they're they're not my favorite. I'm going to be honest. I don't I don't like rubber automated dinosaurs. Well, I, I just have a very very strong nostalgic twinge when you see just like this flappy like Triceratops mouth just sort of go blah, 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 every time the the motor moves. Yeah. I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I love know what that. you mean. I it's love like, that. It's like see like you see a movie where something is obviously fake, but you saw it as a kid. Yeah, and, and you're like I'm I'm sold. And if they remade it and CGI'd and made it great, you're like no, that's not. Yeah. The, I don't. Yeah. If I walked in today and saw that same Triceratops that I saw as a kid, I would be like. Yep, I'm never leaving. Like, yeah. I'm gonna go get a sleeping bag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was it was a a fun, uh, uh, basically a kids exhibit, but we kind of worked on it. Um, actually, myself and our current acting director Allison Stoltman, we were the curators on it. It was a basically a kids' introduction to dinosaurs, and we sort of just 
but it also kind of was a playground. It was kind of fun. And by kids introduction, that also means we sort of had in mind that the kids would be telling their parents about it, which I think yeah. a lot of times yeah. kids tell their parent parents like, what is this stupid thing? And yeah. it's like, it's a blah, 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 sir. It's not, you know, I don't, you're not my real daddy. <laughs> um, but we, we had to remove that because that's a very touch. Hand yeah. Thing. I, I, and, I, I'm remembering now like yeah. the, like the, the, the pterosaur wings that were like the puzzle pieces yes. and everything. Yeah. yeah I think yeah. actually, no, you know what was that? It, maybe that was in Dino Hall, but that boy, we're going to have to get rid of that one too. Yeah. I think. Cause all, that was I remember all those, all but those, we're, we're looking at new ways yeah. to kind of keep things interactive without being hands-on touch, yeah. touch. So that's that's kind of our our, our exhibits team and education team. We're trying to be very creative about coming up with that. The former Dinosaur Gallery is now going to be an exhibit called, I think, Anthropology and Paleontology. And Dr. Emily Early, our anthropology curator, is the is the head curator of this exhibit. And we kind of are using our close down as a opportunity to also emphasize our research collection. So we're mm. making this exhibit a, hey, this is what paleontology mm. is. This is what anthropology is. And we're going to talk about how they're different, maybe how they're similar. It's basically emphasizing our research that we do at the museum. So yeah. people know that we're not just a, we're not just a gallery. We have like active ongoing research as we've kind of talked about. Here I, I think that's what time. happens to most people is like, if you go back 10,000 years or more, anything ology is just like dinosaurs. They're just like, eh, archaeology, find, they find dinosaurs. Yeah. Eh, blah, blah, blah. yeah. You know, sometimes archaeologists find fossils. We've yeah. got, we've got a, uh, you well, can't I mean, stop them. shoot, no, <laughs> we've got, I mean, shoot, Arizona has a good history of mammoth hunters found down in Southern Arizona. So cool. But even here in 07 or something, some archaeologists were working, I think, near Greenfield Road and it was an archaeological dig and there were bulldozers waiting for them you know right behind them because the archaeologists had to kind of work fast before oh, yeah, the bulls yeah. came and they found some Ice Age tortoises and gave us the museum which we're currently working on yeah, right now I think you I remember seeing you did a video on that and you were like pointing at the spot oh, yeah okay. I think it was it was a while ago so god knows oh, but yeah it was like I just remember being like oh my god there was Ice Age turtles and you're like yeah they were right there and it's just like this open field you're yeah. like ah. oh right no that was um that was the Gilbert Mammoth video. That's oh, okay. what that was. Okay, yes. Okay, okay. And that was just an open. Then that's another good example, though. The Ice Age animals that are found in the Phoenix area, the Salt River Basin, mm -hmm. kind of are found generally by construction crews, which, you know, I mean, is another example of, yeah, we had fossils here. Um, yeah. It's kind of hard. It's kind of weird to think that, you know, you look around us, you see houses and buildings, and not even that long ago, you, yeah. you'd see elephants wandering around and yeah, camels and camels and flamingos and all kinds of weird armadillos and stuff but yeah you can just like it'll blow your mind if you think too hard yeah. about it but once again gavin thank thanks you. so much i know our listeners appreciate it i hope the museum can open soon fingers, same here fingers crossed here. we'll see what happens because i really want to get back in there oh man. thank oh, you boy. so much thank you for being such a supporter it, and 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 and, and know, coming to all of our events and helping us out with that stuff any That's, anytime i can support dinosaurs in any way shape or form i'm down and plus like all the all the events are always fun like you're not going to eat finger foods off of a tray with some stodgy guy asking if you want great poupon like it's super fun like all the exhibits are open there's like music and all the artists are always cool like like this i got uh Every time we go, I get paleo art, so I've got myself as several different dinosaurs. Oh, cool. I, I can't tell you how many artifacts I have from this from the museum in this house. So, guys, uh, Gavin, I hope you will come back and we can talk about all the megafauna and stuff like that. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I Thank you. love it, guys. You got to check out. If you're in Arizona, please check out the museum on Facebook and then when it opens in real life. Uh, so once again, guys, thanks for listening, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. For the Podcasts Radio.